Welcome back, everyone, to True Crime Tales, where we delve into the darkest corners of reality. From chilling mysteries to bone-chilling crimes, we bring you haunting tales that are not for the faint-hearted. Join us as we uncover the truth behind real-life nightmares. And please, don't forget to like, share, and hit the subscribe button so we can keep you updated on our latest investigations. Welcome to today's story, Fatal Attraction, Sins of the Heart. Here in the heart of London, Edith Jesse Graydon married to Percy Thompson. Edith born on Christmas Day, December 25, 1893. Daughter to her loving parents, William and Ethel Graydon, in Dalston, London. She was the eldest among five siblings. Her childhood was marked by happiness, and in her early years, she displayed talents in dancing, acting, and academics, particularly excelling in arithmetic. After completing her schooling in 1909, she commenced work at Lewis London, a clothing manufacturer in London. Subsequently, in 1911, she found employment at Carlton and Pryor Wholesale Milliners. Her intelligence and flair for style and fashion earned her recognition, leading to several promotions within the company, ultimately landing her the role of chief buyer, which involved frequent trips to Paris on behalf of the firm. During one of her trips to Paris and through social events, she met Frederick Bywaters, age 18, born 27 June 1902. And later on that year, Edith crossed paths with Frederick Bywaters again in a social meeting, but this time in London with her husband, Percy. Frederick Bywaters was a family friend and a former school classmates of her brothers. And soon Edith, Percy, and Fred became close friends going out together on a social events, parties, and theater. During this time, Edith and Frederick love for each other began to blossom. With Percy being unaware of the situation and his wife, Edith's love for him was true. Frederick, being in the Navy, needed lodgings when back at Port England. Percy, being a gentleman and friend, invited Frederick to take lodgings with them in their family home. And so the love between Edith and Fred started to grow more and more each passing day. But as time passed by, Percy started to notice changes in his wife. He sensed Edith slipping away from him like sand slipping through his fingers. Edith, she became more distant and with glances here and there to Frederick, he started to have his suspicions. But during one of the social events holidaying on the Isle of Wight, South Coast, England, here, they welcomed the man into their social circle and with Edith's sister Avis, accompanying them with friends. During this time in the summer 1921, they held a garden parties at their dwelling. And it was here that things took a nasty turn. Percy now being ever vigilant between his wife Edith and Fred, kept a close eye on the pair watching their every move. What he thought was a kiss between Edith and Fred threw Percy into a fit of rage and jealousy, shattering the fragile facade of marital bliss. Percy's rage flared uncontrollably, leading to a violent altercation that left Edith bruised and shaken. It was then that Fred, unable to stand idly by, intervened, pushing Percy back, which drew the anger out of Percy even more, which he demanded Fred to leave his lodgings and departure from their home. Amidst the turmoil, Edith's sister Avis witnessed the whole procession to the unfolding drama. She observed Edith's bruises and with a heavy heart, her statements to the authorities echoing the silent cries of a love affair veiled in shadows. As fate would have it, Fred's obligations within the Navy at sea kept him away from Edith's side. Yet even the vast expanse of the ocean could not extinguish the flame of their passion. In the solitude of the waves, Edith poured her heart into letters, each word a testament to the enduring bond and the love blossomed between them. With his striking appearance and adventurous tales from his ocean's waves, captivated Edith's imagination, igniting her passion for romantic adventures. In Edith's eyes, the youthful Fred embodied her ideal of romance, contrasting sharply with the perceived stability and predictability of her 29-year-old husband. Upon Fred's return, their reunion was reignited, 
the magnetic pull of their love too strong to resist. Once again, they found solace in each other's arms, their love burning bright against the backdrop of a world that would never understand the depths of their triangle love story. On the fateful evening 3rd of October 1922, Edith and Percy went on a social evening event with family to the Criterion Theater in Piccadilly Circus, London. They are accompanied by Edith's uncle and aunt, the evening held promise of entertainment and camaraderie. However, as the clock struck 11 p.m. and the curtains drew to a close, their journey took an unforeseen turn. Exiting the theater, the group converged at Piccadilly Circus Tube Station, bidding their farewells before parting ways. The couple embarked on the 11.30 p.m. train bound for Ilford, their home nestled in the quiet streets between Ensley and Kensington Gardens. And so, as they traversed the familiar path towards their abode, fate intervened with a violent twist. A figure lurked in the shadows, concealed behind the veil of night, lying in wait amidst the foliage. With sudden ferocity, the assailant emerged, launching an onslaught upon Percy. In the chaos that ensued, Edith found herself cast to the ground, her screams echoing through the silent streets as the brutal struggle unfolded. Tragically, Percy succumbed to mortal wounds inflicted by the assailant's blade, his life slipping away before Edith could summon aid. In the aftermath of the harrowing ordeal, neighbors were roused by the sounds of Edith's desperate cries, pleading for mercy amidst the darkness. When authorities arrived, Edith, still reeling from the shock, struggled to compose herself. Unbeknownst to her, suspicions had already turned towards Fred, a man entwined in the intricate web of her life. He was swiftly apprehended and brought to Ilford Police Station for questioning. Edith's world in turmoil and full of emotions further as she grappled with the gravity of the situation. In a moment of desperation, she divulged her association with Fred, unaware of the damning implications her words would carry. The subsequent investigation unearthed a trove of love letters exchanged between Edith and Fred, revealing a clandestine affair fraught with passion and secrecy. Yet, in a courtroom battle that ensued, the defense contested the relevance of the letters, arguing against their ability to establish a direct link between Edith and the heinous crime. Despite the defense's efforts, Edith Thompson and Frederick Bywaters found themselves bound by the weight of accusation, each charged with the grave offense of murder. As the wheels of justice turned, their fate hung in the balance, tangled in a complex narrative of love, betrayal, and tragedy. The trial commenced on December 6, 1922, at the Old Bailey, both represented by their solicitors. Frederick Bywaters fully cooperated with authorities, leading them to the murder weapon and maintaining that he acted independently of Edith's knowledge. Edith's love letters to Fred were presented as evidence, spanning from November 1921 to September 1922, totaling over 60 love letters. These letters detailed her life in London during Bywater's absence at sea, containing passages suggesting her desire to be free of her husband, Percy. References were made to potentially harmful actions against Percy, including tampering with his food and attempting to induce abortion. But this is uncertain. But what we do know is certain, Percy's life paid the ultimate price. Despite counsel's advice against testifying, Edith insisted on taking the stand in hopes of aiding Fred, displaying a lack of awareness of the peril she faced. However, her testimony did not fare well with the judge and jury, as she repeatedly contradicted herself and claimed ignorance regarding the contents of her letters. Fred maintained that Edith is innocent of his intentions to confront Percy, and asserted that his aim was not murder but rather to confront Percy about their relationship. He attributed Edith's references in the letters to her vivid imagination, influenced by her love of fiction. The trial revealed a complex web of deceit and passion, with both defendants facing serious charges as their fate lay in the hands of the court. On December 11th, the jury delivered a guilty verdict for both Edith Thompson and Frederick Bywaters, condemning them to death by hanging. The courtroom was fraught with emotion as Edith erupted into hysterical screams, while Bywaters vehemently protested her innocence, declaring the jury's decision as erroneous. Leading up to and during the trial, the media fueled sensationalist and critical commentary surrounding Thompson and Bywaters. However, following their death sentences, there was a remarkable shift in public sentiment and media coverage. 
Nearly a million individuals rallied against the harsh punishment, signing petitions in protest. Bywaters garnered admiration for his unwavering loyalty and protective stance towards Edith, while she was widely perceived as the mastermind behind the crime. The prospect of executing a woman, a rarity in British history since 1907, stirred widespread revulsion. Despite mounting pressure and a renewed confession from Bywaters asserting Thompson's innocence, the Home Secretary remained steadfast in his decision to deny reprieve. As the execution date loomed closer, Edith's emotional state deteriorated rapidly. She spent her final days in a state of near hysteria, consumed by despair, unable to find solace or appetite amidst the impending doom. On January 9, 1923, within the somber confines of Holloway Prison, 29-year-old Edith Thompson faced her final moments with a heavy heart, consumed by terror at the looming specter of her own hanging. Overwhelmed by fear, she collapsed, her fragile form barely conscious as the weight of impending doom pressed down upon her. Sedated by the prison governor, her consciousness waning, she was tenderly carried to the gallows by four solemn prison warders. Meanwhile, in Pentonville prison, the 20-year-old Frederick Bywaters, whose love for Edith had driven him to desperate lengths in attempts to spare her from the clutches of imprisonment and death, faced his own fate upon the gallows. The simultaneous executions unfolded at 9 a.m., mere moments apart, within the confines of Holloway and Pentonville prisons, separated by a mere half-mile in North London. As per protocol, the bodies of Edith Thompson and Frederick Bywaters found their final resting places within the prison walls that had witnessed their tragic demise, a poignant testament to the unforgiving grip of fate. The ordeal of carrying out Edith's execution weighed heavily upon her hangman, John Ellis, leaving an indelible mark on his soul. A haunting reminder of the profound emotions that permeated the tragic love triangle that had led to this grim conclusion. The love shared between Edith and Freddie is a central theme in their story, yet much of their correspondence remains shrouded in mystery. Missing are the letters exchanged between them from the time of their arrest on October 5, 1922, to November 16, 1922. Edith only discovered the absence of these letters when she questioned Freddie about them in court. Despite their dire circumstances, a letter from Freddie to Edith on November 19, 1922, reveals that their discussions continued, revolving around literature as before. However, these letters, along with others from their time in remand, have vanished from the National Archives, never returned to their families. During her time in Holloway Prison, Edith penned numerous unpublished letters to her loved ones, including a poignant message to her parents shortly before her death. The contents of this final letter were deemed too sacred to share. While Edith's original letters to Freddie, not presented as evidence during the trial, were returned to her parents in January 1923, their current whereabouts remain unknown. It is speculated that they may be buried alongside Edith's mother, along with her last letter to her parents and her wedding ring. As for the letters used in evidence, they too have vanished from New Scotland Yard storage. Despite assurances of safe custody, subsequent searches in the 1980s proved fruitless, leaving the fate of this crucial evidence uncertain. In the solemn aftermath of Holloway Prison, a reconstruction in 1971, a poignant chapter in history unfolded as the bodies of the executed women, including Edith Thompson, were tenderly exhumed from their unmarked graves within the prison walls. Among them lay Amelia Sack and Annie Walters, their fates intertwined with Edith's in the annals of tragedy. With reverence and heavy hearts, the remains of these women, united in their final journey by the bonds of shared fate, were laid to rest in a single grave at Brookwood Cemetery in Surrey. Here, amidst the quiet serenity of the cemetery grounds, their souls found solace in a collective embrace, a poignant testament to the enduring legacy of love, loss, and the relentless march of time. In 2024, the quest for justice in Edith Thompson's case continues amid doubts about the validity of her conviction. Last year, 2023, the Ministry of Justice rejected a pardon application, but after complaints from Thompson's heirs, the process was reinitiated. According to a spokesman, Deputy Prime Minister referred the case to the Criminal Cases Review Commission for investigation, 
aiming to provide closure to Thompson's family. The decision garnered support from various quarters, including Rene Weiss, an emeritus professor at University College London, who has long advocated for Thompson's innocence. And to the original verdict, citing concerns about the judge's bias against Edith during the trial, these voices amplify the ongoing debate surrounding the fairness of Edith Thompson's conviction and the need for a thorough review of her case. Ladies and gentlemen, as we reflect on the tragic tale of Edith Thompson, the evidence presented during her trial paints a compelling picture of guilt. The existence of love letters exchanged with Frederick Bywaters, coupled with the circumstances surrounding Percy Thompson's murder, suggests a motive and a means. Despite the passage of time, the doubts surrounding Edith's innocence remain clouded in uncertainty. While we acknowledge the complexity of the case, it is imperative to uphold the principles of justice and accountability. However, let us not rush to judgment. The intricacies of Edith Thompson's story demand a closer examination, free from the biases and prejudices of the past. The mere existence of love letters does not conclusively prove guilt, and the possibility of a miscarriage of justice cannot be ignored. As we navigate the murky waters of history, let us approach this case with an open mind, recognizing the need for a thorough review of the evidence and a fair assessment of Edith's culpability. We invite you to share your thoughts and opinions on this compelling story. Do you believe Edith Thompson was rightfully convicted? Or was it a case of miscarriage of justice, a love triangle gone wrong, and let's not forget and spare a thought for Percy Thompson, an innocent man died? Do you harbor doubts about her guilt? What factors sway your judgment, and what questions linger in your mind? Let us engage in a thoughtful dialogue as we seek to uncover the truth behind this enduring mystery. Your insights are invaluable as we navigate the complexities of justice and morality in the case of Edith Thompson. As we conclude the captivating tale of Edith and Freddie's love and loss, we invite you to engage with our content. If you enjoyed this story, please like, share with friends and family, and subscribe to our channel. Your support fuels our growth and enables us to bring you more captivating content like this. Until next time, thanks for watching.